Hello, everybody. I'm Beth Flynn Ferry. I'm the executive director of CARS, the Center for Advanced HR Studies here at Cornell University. And today I'm joined by two of my colleagues, J.R. Keller and Sean Pfaff. And we're going to be sharing some of their recent work addressed, uh, focused on addressing bias in internal and external hiring. So a little background, uh, JR is an assistant professor of HR studies in the ILR school, and his research focuses on how firms combine internal and external hiring to meet their human capital needs, as well as the various ways in which individuals build careers within and across organizations. So welcome, JR. Sean is also an assistant professor in organizational behavior at the ILR school, and Sean's research focuses primarily on topics related to social perception and evaluation, as well as inequality, maintenance, and attenuation in organizations and society. So welcome to you, Sean. So just a little overview here. Um, we did a car survey late last year, and it, it revealed that DE&I is certainly one of the top issues on the agenda for HR for 2021. Uh, for most employers today, uh, that DE&I has transformed from a mere pipe dream to a really strategic imperative and business necessity. To achieve goals in that area, though, employers must acknowledge that bias can permeate virtually any aspect of their business and make a conscious choice to eliminate it. Earlier this month, JR and Sean hosted uh, CAR's working group on this topic, and we wanted to bring them, wanted them to bring their insights from that session along with their ongoing research and share what they've learned so far and to hear some of the issues that they expect to be on the agenda in the future. So for the next 20 minutes or so, uh, we're going to start off by asking JR and Sean a few questions uh, to get at their key insights. But during the discussion, I also encourage you to submit any questions that you have um, using the chat or the Zoom, uh, excuse me, or the Q&A function in Zoom. And we'll try to field some of those questions as they come in, as well as reserve a little bit of time at the end to answer those. So thanks for being here. So JR, let's start with you. Um, in the working group, I know you shared multiple strategies for addressing bias um, in the hiring process. Is there a framework uh, that, you, that you can share with our companies on how to think about grouping those various strategies? Yes, Beth, thanks for having me. And that's a great question for us to start today. I think as we think about all of the various tools and strategies we have for mitigating bias, a really nice way to think about them is how they map onto different stages of the hiring process. So we typically start thinking about the hiring process as beginning with the attraction phase. So this is the part of the hiring process where the organization and the hiring manager is really focused on bringing folks into the hiring pipeline. And then we have a set of strategies really aimed at improving um, or mitigating bias in the selection phase. So that's the phase where hiring managers and organizations are evaluating those candidates who are in the pipeline and ultimately deciding whom to offer and then hire. And then finally, the hiring process concludes with the onboarding and integration phase. So this is where we want to make sure as an organization that the new hire's introduction to the organization goes smoothly and the candidates that we've hired feel embraced and included. Okay, terrific, terrific. Um, Sean, can you give us an example of one of the sources of bias at that attraction phrase, phase that participants might have talked about in the working group? Yeah, Beth, I'm happy to. I think that bias at the attraction phase is very important because it, it can determine who even enters into our pipeline, which is, is super important because that's the main determinant of who makes it through the pipeline is eventually matriculated into our companies. Um, so, you know, something that we talked about a lot in the working group, which is a really important thing to consider, is that the language that we use as a company, um, specifically in things like advertisements and recruitment materials, it matters. It, this language, it can signal to people what the culture of our company is. Um, and so to be more specific, something that we talked about in the working group was this concept of gendered wording, which is that, you know, we can have job advertisements and they can have a greater or lesser degree of masculinized or feminized words in them. So a good example of masculinized words would be things like, you know, leader, competitive, dominant. And to the extent that our recruitment materials might have more of these words, it might communicate to people on the outside that we have more of a masculinized culture at this company. And so when women, for, in, for instance, are looking at these recruitment materials, you know, they might not be thinking, oh, I don't have the skills to do this job, but they might be concerned with whether they're going to belong in this company, uh, whether they're going to find more people like them if they take the offer. And so in this way, the language that we're using to uh, represent our company, it, it, it can really, it can turn some people off and also weave some people in to the hiring pipeline. So it's important to be attentive to. Yeah, I think that is an important issue. And I, I wonder, um, it's nice to get the clarity there on the gendered wording, 
What are some strategies that firms are using to address that? Yeah, so one, um, I, I think there's two pieces here. One piece is just awareness, right? So it, when companies and, and the people who are generating these materials are aware that this can be a problem and we're not just using colloquial language that we're not thinking about, that's sort of the first step. Um, but then beyond awareness, you know, there's, there's some good tools online that are available to help address this kind of problem. One of them is like Textio, for instance, which is a platform that organizations can use and they can type out their recruitment materials in the platform and Textio will give them back a report of you know, the extent to which they're using masculinized wording or maybe the extent to which this job advertisement is going to be more attractive to older individuals. Um, and so you know, first we wanna be aware that this is a possible program, possible problem, sorry. And then um, after we're aware of that, there, there are some, there's some good programs online that can help people to mitigate this. So it's not just you know, matching your job advertisement with a written dictionary of words. There's, there's some tools we can use to make it a bit easier. Yeah, it's great that we've got technology that can, that can help us with that for sure. Um, JR, are there um, any other sources of bias that emerge during the attraction phase? Uh, so, you know, building off what Sean talked about, Sean talked about sort of the, the actual words that are included. And one thing to think about is really just the number of words that are included, mm -hmm. right? We've all had this experience where you go on to Indeed or LinkedIn, you're looking through a job description, and there's a little blurb about the company, eight or 10 things to describe what you do in the job, and then a list of, you know, 27 to 400, you know, required or, um, or desirable attributes. And it then becomes really challenging as candidates to evaluate, like, do I actually possess all the qualifications or credentials that I need for this job? And, and you know, we've certainly seen in the literature documented effects that, um, that when men read a list of preferred qualifications, they're likely to hit apply even if they don't possess all of those. I think it's somewhere around if you hit 60%, you're likely to hit apply. Whereas it's more likely for, for women to actually want to go through a checklist and make sure I hit all of these. And so if you're putting in unnecessary qualifications or what we might think of as nice to haves but not need to haves, then you're likely to miss out on candidates who aren't going to apply because they don't have particular skills or experiences or aren't sure if they do, even though they could probably do that job very well. Okay, okay, great. Um, and then, you know, what are, what are some strategies to help companies address that? Yeah, so, you know, there are at least two strategies. So one is, especially for, for anybody, you know, here listening that is in you know, sort of an HR business partner role, it's to push back on hiring managers. You know, not to be super aggressive, but to just ask, like, why do we actually need this skill? Do we, is this actually required for the job? And if it's not, than to just take it off of the job description, right? So only include what's absolutely needed. Mm -hmm. um, the other piece is, and this came up, which I thought was a very interesting piece, Verizon, for example, is experimenting with actually putting a blurb at the bottom of their job descriptions that says, um, we encourage candidates to apply even if they don't meet 100% of the qualifications listed on this role. So you get candidates with very diverse backgrounds and, and interests um, that are still willing to apply. And I think I'll add one last piece, you know, when, when really discussing what the qualifications for the role are, you know, one of the biggest things that could that increase the scope of the applicants is to really think about how many years of previous experience you need to have. This is one of the biggest barriers to applications as we often say that somebody has to have done the job that we're asking them to apply to for three or four years and you're really limiting yourself because there's lots of people who could acquire those skills in other related roles. Um, and so you're limiting not just the diversity in terms of demographics, but diversity in the skill set. Yeah, yeah, okay, good. Um, Sean, um, moving to the selection phase, uh, there's a lot of discussion about blinding, and I know our companies would be very interested in that. Can you tell us more about what that is? Yeah, we, we talked about blinding a lot in the working group. So blinding is generally a policy whereby we're removing certain information from an evaluation in order to protect the evaluator from bias. Um, so a pretty classic or I guess standard example of blinding would be say, going into the resumes of all of the candidates and just stripping names, right? So we've just removed all of the names and anonymized all of these resumes. This would be a classic example of blinding. Um, you know, zooming out a little bit, blinding 
not as a policy that we actually implement, but as a sort of an idea and a strategy is this notion that we want to be attentive to the information that we're seeking out and including in our evaluations and the information that we're avoiding in those evaluations. We want to you know, proactively look at the evaluation we're going to engage in. Is it hiring? Is it performance evaluation? And we want to say, you know, what is the information I might receive? How much of this do I really want? And how can I avoid the other stuff, which is either going to be biasing or just noisy, which itself is not useful. Um, so yeah, so blinding, I, when I think about it, I like to think about it as a policy that can be implemented that you know, in the context of hiring, for instance, anonymizes resumes. But it can also be thought about as a broader strategy where we're being attentive to the information we include in and the information we exclude from our evaluations. Okay, okay, good. Um, but I, I think some participants might be skeptical of the use of blinding, you know, arguing that it's difficult to increase diversity if you blind hiring managers to those attributes. They kind of want to know who's, who's, uh, who's uh, applying. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really great point. And it was one that was brought up in the working group. And it's, it's important to note that blinding is not just this cure-all fix, right? So let's think about hiring and let's think about racial minority job ads. You know, when they apply to a position and their identity has been removed from a resume, what this is doing is it's blocking uh, discrimination in evaluations because we don't have their, their identity, we can't infer racial category, and so we can't be biased as a function. So that's a good thing. However, when we're just looking at credentials only, blinding is also masking the hand of discrimination and shaping those credentials, right? We can't infer the way the credentials might be shaped by societal inequalities if we don't know who they're attached to. And so in this way, blinding, it can be it can be difficult to sort of square this circle. Uh, and the thing that's important here to think about is that we need to be pairing blinding with other tools at the attraction phase that can increase the diversity of our job candidate pool. So thinking about, you know, the job advertisements and the recruitment materials, one thing that JR noted, which I think is really important, is, you know, we can increase the span of acceptable credentials for candidates. And so and, and if we have job advertisements that don't have gendered or racialized wording, we can increase the number of racial minorities and women who are in our pool. And if we've done that first, and then we apply blinding, then we can get a better set of people to the interview stage. But blinding on its own, yeah, it, it, it can be problematic to just apply as a, a, a one size fits all tool. Yeah, yeah, okay. Just a reminder to those that have dialed in, if you have any questions and wanna put them in the Q and A uh, to please do that. and. Um, uh, JR, uh, back to you here. Blinding is really difficult to implement at the interview stage, though, right? Yeah, it definitely is. Um, it, Sean, correct me if I have this wrong, but I think the classic example of blinding at the interview stage is the Boston Symphony, um, yeah. where years ago they were um, they didn't have a lot of women, right? And so one of the things that they did was was when you know these interviews were actually playing music, right? So they're very clear job skill related interviewing. Um, and they put up a screen between the folks doing the interviewing and the individuals playing. And they also put carpet down so that if women were walking in heels, you couldn't hear that it was a woman walking in. And then that seemed to be very successful in, in increasing the representation of women um, there. But that is a very right particular context and specific example that is really unnatural and unusual in a traditional interview setting. And you can't imagine inviting a job candidate into a conference room and having a giant you know, green screen or something up separating you where you can't see each other. You're gonna certainly be able to hear voices, right? So it's, it's really impractical once you get to the interview stage. And there we have to think about other strategies that might be effective. Okay, and, and Sean, what, are, what else are companies doing to experiment at the interview stage? Yeah, I mean, so, Moving beyond blinding, when we're just interviewing folks, when we brought our candidates through the pipe and now we have a set that we want to interview, I think that there's a lot of things that we can think about. Um, one thing that we talked about in the working group that I think is a nice idea is moving beyond this idea of cultural fit and sort of moving into an idea of cultural addition, right? So uh, I think that when we're sort of trying to categorize job candidates in terms of the extent to which they match with our company's culture, this is this is a process, this sort of cultural fit model that can be rife with stereotyping. However, if we can instead train hiring managers and other evaluators to think about, um, you know, what is this candidate going to add to our culture? And, and to get them to, you know, elicit that information from candidates, we can get around some of this bias at the interview stage. 
So yeah, I think that, that was something that we talked about in the working group, which is it's a useful reframing. Yeah, I love that no notion of uh, cultural ad versus fit. And and JR, we have a question here on uh, diversity, diverse hiring panels. What do you think about that? Ah, I was just going to bring that up. <laughs> um, so it, one of the strategies, right, to 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 mitigate bias is to have multiple folks interview candidates. This is one of the best thing we could do. I'll, I'll return to this idea of structured interviewing here in a minute. But part of that, right, is diversifying the individuals who are interviewing those candidates. Um, because then you're more, you're less likely to have any particular decision-making biases the one individual has, right, play an outsized role in who you select. Um, the, where the data is less, um, where it's a less clear is whether actual panel interviews themselves. So we can think about interview panels in two ways. One, you could think about like, hey, you're going to come to the, to, you know, to the company and you're going to interview with six different people. That can be very useful. If you're having them interview with six people at one time, that is much less effective. So I think it's, I just want to clarify that, that including a diverse set of individuals to have one on it, one interviews with candidates is really the best strategy there. Okay. And then it's certainly related to that is this idea of, um, you know, training the folks who are interviewing candidates to do so in a structured manner. I mean, this is a piece of advice that probably everybody that's listening has heard, but it is, you know, perhaps the one thing we know that can increase the effectiveness of hiring decisions and reduce bias is by using a structured interview process. And that really does mean that every candidate that comes in to interview for a position gets the same set of questions and that those questions are honing in on skills and or behaviors that are relevant for doing the job. And I think this sort of ties this whole idea with blinding and structured interviewing relates to this idea of the goal of purposely seeking out the information that we want. Right? So we want information that allows us to evaluate whether the candidate can do the job while minimizing less relevant information that can often cloud our decision making. And often that introduces implicit biases into, into who we decide to make job offers to. Okay. Yeah, I, I like this idea about the diverse uh, hiring panels. Um, what about requirements for diverse slates? Does that have an impact? How many people, you know, I hear companies, you know, in the past, they might have had, you had to have one person of, of color or, or and or woman on a slate. Now you hear maybe about going up as high as two. What, what are your thoughts there? So this is, um, this is a question where I don't know that we have sort of very super concrete data that suggests there's, there's sort of some mixed evidence on this. So number one is, I think, and I think the basic thing is why this, why the attraction phase is so important is because if you want to, for example, hire somebody like an un, underrepresented minority, you can't hire that person if they never make it into the application pipeline and if they never make it to the interview stage, right? So getting them to that stage is really important. If you are fortunate enough to have, a, a you know, candidates, it really only matters one if they're qualified for the role. So that should be really important. Um, there is some emerging evidence that, um, that you need to have more than one of an other category to increase the odds that an individual from that sort of other category, for lack of a better term, gets selected. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that's um, that's something that we have great evidence on. I just point to one study that one of our colleagues, Brian Lucas, just did. Um, he's in the organizational behavior group here, and and he looked at um, an intervention where he asked candidates to to refer potential candidates to a job, right? And so um, part of the idea was please create a short list of people that might be a good candidate and then gave them targets to, to increase the length of that short list, right? And when you went from say, you know, give us five people that you know that might be good for, for this job to 10, right? The number of women, you know, when men were recommending the number of women included in that list um, grew when you asked them to include a longer list. However, it didn't see an effect on the odds of a woman actually getting hired for the job. So it was able to increase the pool, didn't actually affect the final hiring decision. 
Okay, great. And um, one of our uh, uh, viewers has uh, noted in the in the chat here that it's helpful to track representation numbers at each phase of the hiring process to see if and where diverse talent falls out um, at the, of the process at a greater rate. So that's a great tip, Erica. Thank you. Um, I want to be respectful of your time here. We really appreciate everybody that that hung in on the uh, on the webcast today. Thank you, JR. Thank you, Sean, for sharing your time and knowledge on this important topic. Um, we will be sending a recording out of this webcast to everybody that's dialed in, and we encourage you to share that more broadly in your organization with others. And I'd also encourage you to go out to our website, um, cars.ilr.cornell.edu. We have a number of other webcasts coming up. Um, and we also have just added a spring partner meeting focused on uh, DE&I. And so I, I really encourage you to, to dial in for that because we're doing some research currently, new research with our CARS companies that we'll share then. So once again, thanks for joining us today and uh, have a good week.